right, so we're going to talk here about acute osteomyelitis in the pediatric setting. And really, this is uh, pretty much the same indications as you would have for an adult. The thing about osteomyelitis is that it does have an increased incidence in children. And so I wanted to do some, uh, I want to focus this particularly as we talk about some of the problems in pediatric orthopedic surgery. Uh, but I also wanted to highlight some of the things that we see in children uh, that put them at risk for acute osteomyelitis compared to adults. So osteomyelitis is simply a bacterial infection of the bone, as its name would imply, and it's most commonly due to bacteremia. Now, we all get bacteremia. It's easy to get bacteremia. You can get bacteremia by flossing your teeth. This is something that can happen to us every day through various activities that we do. But with children, they're at an increased risk for osteomyelitis, and it's due to the bacteremia. Why? There is, in bones, underneath the growth plate, around the growth plate, there's this venous sinusoid. And this venous sinusoid gets very, very slow blood flow. And anytime you have slow blood flow, you're at increased risk for clotting and infection. And infection is what we see here. So, what this means is that if a child has bacteremia, significant bacteremia, uh, for instance, if they had strep throat, uh, or, or if they had uh, any kind of uh, staph infection that got into their blood, they are at a high risk for osteomyelitis because that blood is ultimately going to go through this sinusoid and it moves very slowly and so that any bacteria that's in the blood can proliferate. And when it proliferates in that sinusoid, it's at direct contact with the bone. And at that point, you can get osteomyelitis. So. The bacteremia is the ultimate cause, but the venous sinusoid uh, underneath the growth plate is what makes children at a higher risk for osteomyelitis than adults. They can also get osteomyelitis from secondary causes, and those secondary causes are the same as we would see with adults. So surgery, uh, trauma, foreign bodies, prosthetics, among others. The long bones are going to be most commonly involved, particularly in children, because they have uh, larger growth plates. And then as far as organisms, it's going to be the same as what we see in adults. So the number one cause overall is Staphylococcus aureus. Other causes are uh, staph, uh, or, sorry, strep pneumo, uh, espiogenes. Uh, MRSA is going to be a really important one if you're working in an area, if you're serving a community where uh, community acquired MRSA is, uh, is a problem. That's something that you'll have to consider. And then Haemophilus, and by Haemophilus, I mean uh, type, uh, the, the type B, so HIV. Uh, immunocompromised patients, you should always consider Pseudomonas. Just because of, their, uh, because of their immunocompromised state, they are more likely to carry Pseudomonas in their blood. And then patients with penetrating trauma, remember that Pseudomonas is in the dirt. So a patient that for instance, maybe steps on a nail, or if they have a wound that's dirty, you should consider Pseudomonas um, as a possible cause. Particularly what I'm talking about here, though, is if you, if you, uh, if, if you st like stepping on a nail or stepping on a, a, a piece of wood outside uh, that, that breaks the skin, uh, and, and then you get uh, symptoms of osteomyelitis, you should always consider pseudomonas if there's penetrating trauma because it's coming from the outside in. Uh, patients with sickle cell disease, you should consider salmonella. Now, patients with sickle cell disease have an increased incidence of acute osteomyelitis and a definitely an increased incidence of salmonella osteomyelitis, but still the number one overall cause for patients with sickle cell disease is staph aureus. That's a classic board question. They ask you the number one cause, and they give you the vignette of a sickle cell disease patient, and ask you what's the most common pathogen behind this patient's osteomyelitis. What's most likely? It's still going to be Staph aureus, even though Salmonella is a distinct cause, uh, particularly in these sickle cell disease patients. Staph aureus is still the number one cause overall. And then sexually active patients that can still be children. So start thinking 12, 13 very possible the child could be sexually active. Neisseria gonorrhea is a very common cause of osteomyelitis. And then the major complication of osteomyelitis is going to be septic arthritis as it spreads into the synovium.
So what do we look for in the history of a patient with acute osteomyelitis? Well, a lot of them are going to have been sick recently because they will have needed something to cause the bacteremia uh, that precipitated the osteomyelitis. So look for a history of a febrile infection, also penetrating trauma or any kind of surgery. You should also get information on their sexual history if it's age appropriate. I mean, nobody's going to fault you for asking about sexual history, but you might get some weird looks if you ask an eight-year-old and their parents are around. Uh, but definitely anybody 12, 13 and older, it is absolutely appropriate to get information on their sexual history. And then information on their HIV, Haemophilus B uh, vaccination status. That's a vaccination that children get when they're very young. If they didn't get that vaccination, they're at risk for infection with Haemophilus B and that's going to affect how we treat the patient. Symptoms uh, and physical examination. So the classic symptoms of uh, osteomyelitis are what we would suspect with any kind of inflammatory process. So the, the patient is going to tend to be febrile, chills, uh, though they're usually, well, they'll always be overlying erythema around where the, the bone is. There'll be pain, there'll be warmth. So remember the, the classic uh, Dolor, Ruber, Calor uh, findings of, uh, of inflammation. And then a lot of times the patient is going to have a decreased range of motion uh, just due to the pain and especially if there's concurrent septic arthritis going on. So some patients might not present until much later on and if they don't present until much later they may have a concurrent septic arthritis. If there is a drainage ulcer, which we do of course associate with osteomyelitis, that is suggestive of a more chronic osteomyelitis and so the management is going to be a little different. We're not talking about chronic osteomyelitis here, we're talking about acute osteomyelitis, so I just wanted to clear that up. Routine labs are going to be important to get, as in most patients, uh, so you'll want to make sure that you have at least a CBC. Erythrocyte sedimentation rate is also useful. As you can imagine, we would expect to see the normal signs of inflammation on labs, which would be increased white blood cell, increased neutrophil, and increased ESR. You should also, with your labs, uh, with the blood that you get, get cultures on that blood because we're going to want to see if there's any bacteria in the blood that could certainly be what's precipitating or what precipitated the osteomyelitis. As far as diagnosis, the best initial diagnostic test is a bone scan. Now, if you had a patient who had chronic osteomyelitis, yes, you could go ahead and get an x-ray. The fact is, it takes five to seven days for there to be x-ray bone changes uh, noticeable on x-ray uh, to uh, in osteomyelitis. Let me, let me say that again. It takes about five to seven days in order to get an abnormality on your x-ray in osteomyelitis. So if it's a patient who's only had this for a couple days, you're not going to have, you're going to, you, you, you'll likely have a normal x-ray. You won't be able to outrule osteomyelitis with an x-ray. So the best initial diagnostic test is a bone scan, it's particularly if the patient has only had symptoms for uh, less than a week. Now the most accurate diagnostic test with any any infection, this goes for all of infectious disease, the most accurate test is going to be the culture. So you'll want to get an aspiration of the affected bone um, as that's the most accurate test. And that should be done to obtain cultures. Uh, and this can be done uh, as part of therapy as well, as part of the therapy for osteomyelitis uh, may involve debridement. So this is a patient with osteomyelitis. You can see here it's on the, uh, the great toe. And here's the redness, a little bit of swelling. I bet if you felt this, it would be warm to the touch and the patient wouldn't really like you. What do we do for treatment? So remember that the most common cause of acute osteomyelitis is staph aureus. So we're mostly going to be targeting our therapy towards staph aureus. So some patients will need surgical drainage, not all of them. And by drainage, I just mean debridement, uh, not necessarily draining it in the same way you're draining uh, pus from, a, from an abscess, but uh, debridement uh, in, in, in some cases. 
Um, in other cases, it won't, necess it won't be necessary. Uh, but IV antibiotics are always going to be necessary in acute osteomyelitis. And as I mentioned, we're going to be focusing the uh, therapy initially towards staph aureus uh, because that is the number one cause. So what do we use for staph aureus? We use the semi-synthetic penicillins. And so that would be something like nafcillin. You can also use clindamycin as well. Vancomycin should be used if you're in an area uh, where community-acquired MRSA is common, and that's just because vancomycin is effective against MRSA. So I just want to point this out. I, clindamycin is not a semi-synthetic penicillin. Nafcillin is, but clindamycin can be used as well uh, as nafcillin. Uh, clindamycin, we would particularly want to use that in patients who are allergic to penicillins because they would likely be allergic to the semi-synthetic penicillins as well. So nafcillin or clindamycin, uh, in most cases where we're just expecting regular old staph aureus, if you're in an area where community-acquired MRSA is common, you should use vancomycin. Now, if the patient has not been vaccinated to HIV, Haemophilus B, or if they are younger than three, then we're going to add on a third-generation cephalosporin so that we're, uh, that we're getting rid of HIV if that's present. So we want to make sure that we're targeting that, too, if it's a patient younger than three or if they weren't vaccinated. And so the third generations are cefuroxime, ceftriaxone, et cetera, et cetera. There's a ton of them. If the patient has joint symptoms present, you can consider adding rifampin. Rifampin is a great drug to use because it can penetrate biofilms. And that's something that makes it relatively unique in the antibiotic world. And when you get joint, when you, when you get joint disease in osteomyelitis, there is usually a biofilm that's present. And so rifampin is a great drug to add if there are any joint symptoms uh, in addition to the uh, osteomyelitis. As mentioned before, if the patient is immunocompromised or if they have penetrating trauma, you should cover pseudomonas. So things you can use for pseudomonas would be uh, like linazolid. Linazolid is rather expensive though, so you could also go with tobramycin um, or uh, piperacillin tazobactam. And as usual, reassess the antibiotics after the culture results. That's just common sense. That's why we're getting the culture um, so that if it winds up being uh, something different, then you can tailor your antibiotics towards that particular, uh, that particular organism. So if, for instance, you were covering Pseudomonas, but it wound up culturing Staph aureus, then uh, you could perhaps discontinue the Pseudomonas drug. So uh, that's why we get that culture. We want to know exactly what it is. And after discharge, usually the patient's going to need about three to five, uh, maybe seven days of IV antibiotics. Uh, but once you've discharged the patient, they are going to need to continue on their antibiotics on an oral equivalent form for about two weeks. So just to recap, osteomyelitis is more common in children overall. Uh, Classic symptoms of inflammation are, uh, Im uh, sorry, classic symptoms are inflammation over the bone, uh, which can oftentimes be confused with cellulitis. Uh, you should get labs to corroborate the fact that you've got, uh, that, that you've got a, a, an actual, uh, that, that you have an actual infection, and then you should proceed with bone scan, uh, which is the best initial test within seven days. It's also really important, as always, to remember specifics of the patient's history in this case, we're thinking trauma, HIV vaccination status, if they're immunocompromised, if they have sickle cell disease, or if they are uh, or have been sexually active. Uh, then treatment is going to include cultures, both of the peripheral blood and of uh, the aspiration around the uh, bone, if you can get it. And then antibiotics uh, are going to be needed um, which most of the time, uh, all the time, is at least going to include a semi-synthetic penicillin focusing towards staph aureus. And the major complication is septic arthritis.